uh, everyone. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Global Immunotalks. I'm very excited uh, to host this today. My name is Burkhard Becher. I'm from the University of Zurich. And uh, um, before I um, uh, introduce our next speaker, um, I'd like to remind you uh, that in Global Immunotalks that uh, if you have questions after the seminar, you should go on Twitter and the slides will be shared with you one more time, the, the, the link and, and how, to, how to engage with our speaker for today. And the other reminder is that next week we'll have Joanna Groom presenting. Um, it is such a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, it's Ken Murphy, and uh, I'm, I'm, Ken is a, is, a, is a fantastic scientist and a great friend, and I'm very, very happy that he agreed to speak today. Um, Ken has, is, a, is a native of the United States, and he has done his bachelor, actually, in chemistry at Rice University in Houston. After this, he uh, went to Johns Hopkins University to study medicine uh, at the medical school in Baltimore. He studied medicine and became an, an MD in, in, in 1984. Uh, then he went to Wash U in St. Louis to study uh, pathology, to his residency in pathology, where he also became a chief resident. He then decided he wants to become, uh, he wants to do more science and became um, a postdoctoral fellow also at Wash U again. And since a while, he is the Eugene O.P. First Centennial Professor of pathology and immunology. So Ken has been in St. Louis for some time, but everyone knows Ken's work. And what he's really well known for, obviously it's hard to put in a nutshell, is probably T-cell DC interactions in the context of intracellular infection, but also uh, cancer. Um, he made some fundamental discoveries regarding transcriptional control of DC function and fate, he, the discovery of BATF3 in, 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 in CDC1s, but also NOTCH and CMIC in DC function. His team discovered the utility of uh, ZBTB46 uh, in DC lineage tracing and the role of BATF in T cell polarization, etc. etc. I think very, very critically, a lot of people forget that Ken actually in his team discovered the role of IL 12 in type 1 immune responses uh, a while back. Um, so uh, Ken also does a lot of public work. So he's the lead author in Janeway's Immunobiology. He is, uh, oh, he was an associate investigator at Howard Hughes Medical School from, uh, from uh, until 2003. In 2016, he became a member of the National Academy of Science. He won many, many awards, including the uh, Meritorious Career Award by Thermo Fisher, the William B. Coley Award for Distinguished Research, etc. So without going too much into, I could go on and on and on, his CV goes on forever, but really one of the things, Ken, thanks so much for being here. And as you know, and as I warned you earlier, what we do here at Global Immunotalks is we, we ask a question or two, uh, like a general question. We have a list of questions that we'd like to know from you. And so the first question I have for you, Ken, what advice would you give to a young Ken Murphy? Well, I'm pretty old now. So I probably suggest that the young Ken Murphy not take any advice from old scientists. <laughs> very good. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. What was the, <laughs> what's the mistake that you think taught you the most in your scientific career? Well, I've been around WashU for a long time. My biggest mistake was not taking advice from the old scientists who are around <laughs> here. I can't expect to that. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right. So uh, just as a reminder, at the end of the seminar, I, I, I'll give you the, the screen in a second. At the end of the seminar, it, it'll end a bit abruptly. We won't ask questions. Please post your questions on Twitter to Ken and Ken will engage with you there. Um, it is such a pleasure to have you and I'm excited to hear your seminar about the transcription control of DC um, diversification. I share screen now? Please do, yes. Okay. So um, I have a... Uh, So I have a disclosure, I'm on the SAB of the Harbor Biomed uh, Company. Uh, uh, today I'm going to, I think the title I gave was the transcriptional control of CDP divergence, but I'm gonna give a short 
update on some work. Uh, all this is unpublished work. Um, uh, some work on DC vaccines. And then I'm going to, the main topic is the mechanism of CDP divergence. So one can ask, uh, you know, the only FDA approved DC vaccine is Provenge, but you could ask uh, why was that not a very effective uh, uh, therapy? And really the question is, can DC vaccines be approved? So, <clears throat> so Provenge was based upon uh, the development of uh, a type of cell called various things, but uh, monocyte-derived dendritic cells, GMDCs, uh, and they really stemmed from work in the early 90s from Ed Engelman and then later from uh, Salusto and Lanzavecchia that demonstrated that bone marrow-derived progenitors or, or monocytes could be turned into very highly effective cross-presenting uh, cells that, were, uh, that are shown here. Um, the idea behind the DC vaccine based on Provenge was that uh, monocytes would be harvested from a person. Uh, they would undergo this treatment uh, in exposure to cytokines. Eventually, they would be uh, given, uh, in this case, pancreatic antigens to induce uh, an immune response introduced into the patient. And here's the real crux of the matter. They were introduced into the patient uh, and expected to directly prime host T cells. <clears throat> and that would have been great if that's how they worked. Um, I'm only highlighting two papers, one from Thomas Brocker in as early as 2003 and later by Nina Bardwaj in 2010. And there's a, a third paper by Dr. Gunn. What they showed was that when Provenge induces an immune response, it really does so by releasing its antigens, which are then taken up by host dendritic cells. And these host dendritic cells are the actual direct primer of the uh, T cells in the, in the patient. And so uh, this really could make you think that Provenge is really just a very expensive way to deliver antigens. So one attitude would be why waste any more time on DC vaccines at all? So Steve Ferris is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, and he came, uh, and this is unpublished work for him. Uh, he had done previous work on the mechanisms of uh, help uh, by DC1s. Uh, Steve asked the question, can DC1s as a vaccine, many people are considering using DC1s as a, as a tumor vaccine uh, therapy, is, is DC1 vaccination going to have the same problem as Provenge? And so he took up this, uh, this uh, work I'm going to show you. Uh, we have two different uh, genetic models that completely lack DC1s. One is the old BATF3 knockout mouse, but a new one, which is a better one, is this enhancer mutation of IRF8, uh, where the 32 KB downstream enhancer of IRF8 has been deleted so that BATF3 and IRF8 can't uh, bind and activate uh, and keep the IRF8 gene on into DC1. So he took this approach. He used the IRF8 Delta 32 mouse as a platform. Now this mouse has no DC1s of its own, and that's shown here. Wild type DC1s from the spleen uh, in a wild type mouse here, but in the Delta 32, they're gone, they never develop, and they can't be reinstated by conditions that would reinstate them in the BATF3 knockout mouse. So they stay gone under all conditions. Now, as, as you'd expect and predict, wild type, these are, it, uh, these are uh, tumors, thanks to Bob Schreiber, this is the 1956 tumor in his case, and Mike White uh, is the and his team here make all the mice that I'm going to talk about uh, for us in the core, uh, the, the gene uh, targeting core. So wild type mice can uh, delete this, uh, can reject this tumor, but of course, if you lack DC ones, as in the Delta 32 mouse, uh, you never can reject a tumor like this because you can't prime CD8 T cells. So his question was fairly straightforward. He would culture. Uh, FLT3 ligand or GMCSF plus IL-4 to make uh, either DC1s and DC2s or GMDCs, and he would inject these directly into the tumor that had been placed in a Delta-32 mouse. And uh, if you look here at the red panel, th this is the old GMDC. This would confirm the results of Brocker and Nina Barbwaj and, and on, uh, where GMDCs failed to be able to induce rejection uh, in a mouse lacking its own DC1s, but injection of DC1s directly into the tumor, 
without even adding antigen. Uh, the DC1s apparently infiltrate the tumor, carry antigen back to the lymph node, and prime a CD8 T cell response that's effective for rejecting the tumor. Uh, and of course, DC2s don't seem to be able to do it probably because uh, of their in vivo inability to uh, cross prime. Now, DC1s not, on, not only are able to reject the tumor, uh, these experiments are to show why probably it is that GMDCs uh, don't work. Uh, they Most likely it's their failure to be able to migrate to local lymph nodes uh, after injected into the tumor. So uh, uh, a normal, uh, this is parking OT2 T cells uh, in a mouse and then looking at uh, 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 the induction so this proliferation here would be wild type host. Uh, this is uh, wild type mice uh, cross priming uh, or activating OT2 T cells. Uh, if you put the DC1s into the mouse, you can also get uh, migration of these DC1s to the local lymph node where the OT2 are able to proliferate. So DC1s are probably are able to not only cross prime, but also to migrate, whereas uh, the GMDCs likely cross prime, but don't migrate. Uh, you, if you look at the Tetramer expansion, you can see the same thing. DC1s uh, injected into a, a Delta 32 mouse induce a, a fairly good Tetramer specific response to the tumor. DC2s don't, GMDCs basically don't. Uh, and you can see that uh, licensed over, uh, shown over here. <clears throat> so that basically says there's some hope for DC1s uh, because they're, of their ability to directly prime after migration to local lymph nodes. I want to address one other uh, feature uh, of this system. So uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, in examining the tumor microenvironment. Uh, this is a, uh, a graphical abstract from a paper by Tom Gajewski a few years ago, uh, where um, there is, a, there is a, uh, a role for DC infiltration into the tumor microenvironment. But I've never been able to think of a, a way to directly manipulate the uh, peripheral DC development uh, as opposed to the, um, uh, the DCs that are migrating directly to the, to the lymph node. So, I, so um, but this suggested that there may be a role. What we wanted to test is whether there is a, an absolute role or requirement for DCs in the tumor, tumor microenvironment. So uh, uh, what, Steve did again was to put tumors on both sides of a Delta 32 mouse. So this mouse again lacks its own DC1s and DCs would be injected into one of the sites. <clears throat> so if DCs are required at the tumor microenvironment, then you would expect that only this uh, uh, tumor might be rejected. Whereas if DCs are only required to prime CD8 T cells, but, not, but are not necessary for the uh, uh, the the, the uh, rejection of the tumor, then th this would also, this side would also be rejected. Now I have to do the control. Intravenous DC1 uh, does not lead to tumor specific uh, rejection. So here's putting in DC1s intravenously. Uh, that apparently is insufficient to uh, get enough CD8 T cells primed uh, in, a, in a tumor draining lymph node, uh, whereas injection into the tumor uh, does. So the results from the uh, uh, testing the abscopal effect are shown here. Uh, when you, this is the injected tumor and it regresses, uh, 10 out of 11 of these tumors regressed, but the contralateral tumors, which were not injected and which um, uh, uh, didn't, don't have DC1s in the tumor microenvironment also largely regress. So we would interpret this to mean uh, that uh, you don't necessarily have to have DC1s present at the tumor site as long as the, the massive CD8 T cell expansion was sufficient uh, in, in that case. So this is just the, uh, the summary for this section. Uh, a lot of people are interested in DC vaccines and uh, we would suggest then that DC1 vaccines uh, may be more effective than the Provenge uh, approach because of probably their ability to maintain their capacity for migration. Now I'm going to turn my attention to the main topic. Again, this is unpublished work from a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Tian Tian Lu, shown here, uh, canoeing on the Missouri uh, River, I suppose. Um, the question is, how does CDP divergence uh, 
get regulated to de generate the DC1 and DC2 lineages that uh, we think are the main uh, components of the DC, conventional DC field. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about uh, three things that Tiantan did, and if there's time, uh, I'll, um, I'll mention this uh, mechanism of DC loss during infection. So here's the a diagram. So the, mo the MDP, I don't know if it really comes from the CMP or some other, uh, uh, but the, mo the monocyte dendritic cell progenitor can give rise to CMOPs, which lead to monocyte development, or the common dendritic cell progenitor, or the CDP, as I'll say. And our question here is, how does the CDP give rise uh, and split its uh, development into the DC1 or the DC2 uh, lineages? And then in a moment, I'll also talk about PDC differentiation. But really, at this point, uh, our major focus is on this split. So the, the starting point for the talk I'm going to give right now uh, was really from this paper. This is a published paper in 2019. Uh, Tan Tan was an author on this paper, and Prachi Bagadia and Xiao Huang, also all co-first authors. And the major uh, components of this paper uh, were examining a series of transcription factors. Two of them I need to introduce right now. One of them is NFIL3, and the other one is ZEB2. Now, in it, the, the point of this paper was to examine the hierarchy and interactions of these three transcription factors, ID2 as well, in regulating DC1 development. Um, Tan Tan's major focus was on the factor NFIL3, which is a uh, BZIP uh, domain uh, DNA binding protein, th uh, thought to be a repressor, although some data suggests that it may also be an activator, and I'll deal with that in a moment. <clears throat> Tan Tan's focus was on the uh, germline deficiency of NFL3, uh, showing that uh, the pre-DC1, which we had identified in an earlier study, uh, depended upon the actions of NFL3. So we were able to, uh, in a paper in 2015, use the factor ZBTB46 to identify a kit intermediate population, which we showed was the clonogenic progenitor of the DC1. We called it the pre-DC1 in the bone marrow. There are also other ways to identify that same population. One of them, for example, shown on the right, is the induction of ID2. There, this is an ID2 GFP reporter. The same population becomes ID2 positive, and that's also missing in the germline NFIL3 deficient mouse. And also a loss of ZEB2 expression shown here, again, at the kit intermediate stage, uh, is this loss of ZEB2 is uh, uh, seen in that population in the NFL3 deficiency. Now that said that NFL3 may act uh, upstream of these other factors. Uh, Tan Tan uh, asked whether or not NFL3 is required for maintenance of the DC1 phenotype after uh, the uh, development. So this was a, an experiment where an early Cree, VAV Cree, was crossed to the NFL3 flox, flox mice that we got from Masato Kubo. And uh, later on, an, an, a CD11C Cree uh, crossed to the same flocks. Now the NFL3 early Cree deletion leads to a major loss of DC1 development uh, shown here. But late 11, 11C Cree mediated deletion uh, leaves DC1s intact, and I'm not showing you, but these are uh, these are the numbers over here, and these are basically normal DC1s. So we examined uh, existing GFP reporters for NFL3 because we were interested in trying to identify the earliest specified DC1 uh, progenitor in the uh, right within the CDP. Um, so we discovered that the GFP reporters that are based upon an iris GFP cassette inserted into the NFL3 locus uh, over, tend to overexpress, be, probably because of the stability of the GFP protein. So Tian Tian uh, engineered a completely functional GFP NFIL3 fusion protein, shown here, where GFP is placed upon placed in the uh, amino terminus of the coding region of the NFIL3 gene. <clears throat> and the data shown here and over here shows that this is a completely normal functioning uh, NFIL3 uh, transcription factor. So here, overexpression of the NFIL3 GFP fusion protein uh, kills PDC development and strongly skews 
uh, towards DC1 development, just like the normal NFL3 protein. And when she finally made the homozygous GFP knock-in fusion protein mouse, uh, everything was normal. So uh, PDC development is not affected. DC1 and DC2 ratios are not affected. So it looks like this reporter is faithful and authentic. She then wanted to see if she could identify the earliest cells that are moving towards the DC1 pathway. So uh, this here is showing the level of GFP expression in the MDP and the CDP and the pre-DC1. You see, really, uh, the it's only the CDP, the common DC progenitor, uh, at kid intermediate stages that are uh, turning very much of the NFL3 G, uh, GFP fusion protein on. And even by the time you get to what we identified uh, a few years ago as the pre-DC1, which has moved out of the CDP gate, that cell is already negative for GFP expression. So it, I'm diagramming that interpretation down here. There's really a very short transient pulse of, uh, of NFL3 expression. But what that allowed her to do was to go back into the CDP and take the GFP positive or negative fraction of the CDP and ask what are their fates. You can see that expression of NFL3 uh, in the CDP has already, this is now endogenous NFL3 as a fusion protein, has already excluded uh, the capacity of those cells to become a PDC. Uh, this is taking those cells and culturing them in FLT3 ligand in vitro. Uh, and it also highly skews those cells, maybe not 100%, but highly skews them towards the DC1 lineage. So it looks like this, these fraction of GFP positive cells in the CDP is uh, on its way to becoming a DC1. Tian Tian was curious of what might regulate the induction of NFL3. And here we, uh, 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 we collaborated with uh, an old fellow of ours, Ansu Satpathy and Julia Belk, uh, who works with Ansu at Stanford. And uh, what Tian Tian did was to sort from the CDP, the GFP positive fraction or negative fraction, uh, and along with uh, just wild type CDPs, um, uh, or, or rather uh, pre-DC1s. And uh, we submitted those to Ansu for a tax seek. And first of all, you can see that the level of uh, NFL3 expression is highly induced only in this GFP positive fraction of the CDP. And it's already gone uh, in the pre-DC1 uh, and it's not expressed highly in the GFP negative fraction. So Ansu performed the taxi for us and that's shown here. Uh, really, it was remarkable that there was only basically one peak that was present in all three samples from the GFP positive CDP that differed uh, across the genome from uh, from the other two samples. And that was at the plus 290 region. NFL3 is transcribing to the left here. So at the plus 290 region of NFL3, uh, she saw a peak. And uh, she carried out this experiment, again, thanks to Mike White, where she took guides that flank this, about 400 base pairs uh, uh, flanking uh, this, this peak and made a mouse that we call the Delta 290. Now she did a tricky thing. She made this deletion both in the NFL3 GFP fusion protein mouse and also in a wild type NFL3. So over here, you can see the wild type NFL3 reporter shows about you know uh, the 25% uh, green positive CDPs, but deletion of these 400 base pairs around that enhancer completely eliminated GFP induction in the CDP. And then if you look over here, um, for the uh, peripheral DC1 development in the periphery, uh, the Delta 290 uh, is almost completely devoid of DC1 development. Uh, so it looks like this one enhancer is required for induction of NFL3 uh, in the uh, uh, in, in vivo. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, NFL3 has been reported to be regulating other fate decisions. Uh, in particular, the NK cell and ILC field has noted NFL3's activity. And Tian Tian also finds that the same enhancer is required for the induction of NK cell development in this mouse as well. Now, going back to the paper where Tian Tian, Bagadia, and, uh, 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 and Xiao Huang uh, collaborated, um, it looked like NFL3 
was upstream of ZEB2, but deletion of ZEB2 in the NFL3 background led back to the development of DC1s. And that, I'm not summarizing the whole paper, but I'm showing the circuit. So either NFL3 could directly induce ID2 or NFL3 could act as a repressor. And the literature has said both. So Tian Tian wanted to ask the question, specifically in the case of DC1 development, uh, is NFL3 acting as a repressor or an activator to drive DC1 specification? So she took the normal NFL3 uh, gene and replaced this region with either a crab repression domain shown in blue <clears throat> or a VP16 activation domain shown in red. And she uh, expressed these uh, proteins along with NFL3 and asked which one acts like the normal NFL3. And as you can see here, it's the repressor form of NFL3 because the NFL3 uh, DNA binding domain and leucine zipper are intact. So we suspected that the gene targeting uh, specificity would remain the same. Just we would be either imposing a clear repressive domain or an activation domain. Now NFL3 as a repressor, artificial repressor, acted just like normal NFL3 in driving DC1, killing PDC development. But the activating form of, uh, of NFL3 uh, had the opposite effect. It drove all of the uh, progenitors towards a DC2 phenotype. So we suspected uh, then that we're looking for an action of NFL3 that would, that would have an, a repressive activity. So um, uh, uh, in the Bagadia paper, and, and again now, um, uh, we had identified potential targets that either increased during DC1 specification or that decreased during DC1 specification. And among the ones that decreased, these could be potential targets of NFL3 uh, was this factor ZEB2. So Tian Tian carried out uh, a, a series of uh, chip seek, attack seek, and cut and run uh, to look for the direct binding of NFL3 to various places in the genome. I'm showing you here the most recent data. This is a NFL3, uh, endogenous NFL3 expression using the cut and run technique, which is a modified form uh, invented by Hennikoff. Uh, uh, more recently, but it's similar to a ChIP-seq uh, approach in which the GFP positive bone marrow progenitors uh, show a clear NFL3 uh, binding to uh, a region near the ZEB2 locus uh, at minus 165 KB. And the GFP negative uh, bone marrow uh, does, not, uh, does not show this binding. Uh, and this is in the same site where she found NFL3 binding in an overexpressed NFL3 in a HOXB8 system uh, and also by ChIP-seq. So within this uh, region, that this is the uh, minus 165 KB enhancer. Now that may not be familiar to many people, but it was familiar to us uh, at that time because uh, about a year ago, uh, Xiao Huang had gone on from the, uh, the first Bagadia paper with him uh, to, um, to, to, to look at um, regulation of ZEB2. And he had already identified a region uh, a similar region in the ZEB2 locus. And so we call this the minus 165 ZEB2 enhancer. His interests in it had largely been motivated by it, the E box binding where E2A and E22 appear able to bind to uh, this region and support ZEB2 expression. Uh, and deletion of this whole enhancer, which he did, uh, led to the loss of B cell and PDC development, probably because of the loss of the E2 uh, a and E22 binding in this enhancer, but um, we, he also discovered that deletion of this enhancer led to uh, a lack of monocytes, which we didn't understand at the time. Um, so Tian Tian wanted to ask whether NFL3, she had mapped it to this region, she noticed that there were three sites uh, I'm showing here in red uh, that had a motif for NFL3 binding. Uh, and so using the old fashioned IMSA approach, uh, we took probes, uh, this is a consensus NFL3 probe, and this is a uh, from one of those sites in the ZEB2 enhancer, and that they can bind NFL3 uh, here overexpressed in a cell line, and this band that you see here on IMSA uh, is shifted up when you add an antibody specific for NFL3. So this looked like uh, an authentic ability of the uh, NFL3 to bind to this region, and also using a competition assay, we could show that these other two sites 
uh, we can call them site two and site three, uh, also act as competitors. So site one is the best competitor shown down here, but sites two and three are also able to reduce uh, binding. So they also appear to be able to bind. So Tan Tan wanted to carry out this experiment. So uh, she wanted to ask whether the hypothesis was that NFL3 is binding to these sites, acting as a repressor, blocking ZEB2, and allowing DC1 development. So the question is, does the mutation of these sites individually have the same effect? So, um, uh, so what she did was to carry out a, uh, uh, shown down here, a targeted interruption of each of these sites. Uh, she replaced them with uh, enzyme sites for mapping. And the very first site targeted, shown site one, uh, we made a mouse on it. I'll call it the we, uh, I'll call it the delta one. Here's the sequence. Uh, the only thing that's changed in the 165 KB enhancer is the deletion of this site one, replaced by this sequence, the not one site. And we were very happy at first to see about a 50% reduction in the number of DC ones. So this was all happening during the pandemic in the last two years. So we had nothing better to do. So uh, we uh, decided, well, Tan Tan took up the task to go ahead and make all the uh, combinations of mice that I'm showing here. So after this first round, uh, she followed that up by uh, attempting to make uh, targetings of site two and site three. And, uh, and you can see we ended up with all of the mice that I'm showing you here. Again, thanks to Mike White and his excellent team. So we have Delta One, Delta One plus two, one plus three, and Delta one, two, three, uh, where we got rid of each of these individual NFL3 binding sites. So this is the first site I showed you. We were very encouraged. We had uh, went down about 50%. Now we we're expecting to continue to lose DC1 development. Unfortunately, when we just knocked out the uh, second site in the one plus two mouse, basically DC1 development went back to normal. When we went to the one plus three mouse, uh, it got even worse for us because DC1 development increased. And then when we knocked out all three sites, we basically had as the, the maximum number of DC1s and almost no DC2s. So to put that in perspective, we got exactly the opposite result of our of what we had expected. We now had a mouse, call it the Delta 1, 2, 3, uh, which basically shown here has no DC2s. Uh, there's a few cells uh, in this gate we're not even sure if they're DC2s and they, uh, they profile to look more like uh, 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 lymphoid derived cells. Uh, and if you look in the bone marrow over here, uh, this is the pre-DC2 clonogenic progenitor that we had identified in, uh, in uh, 2015. And that progenitor is completely missing in the Delta 1, 2, 3 mouse. They're also missing from the migratory and resident gates in the lymph nodes uh, in the one, two, three mouse. And uh, the monocytes uh, are also missing from this mouse. So, uh, but importantly, B cells and plasmacytoid DCs develop. Uh, so the enhancer still appears to be functional in B cells and PDCs. What I'll point out right now is that uh, PDCs are down by about 50%. And I'll come back to that in a second. So this was our original hypothesis that NFIL3 would suppress ZEB2 at these sites. But instead, we've discovered that there may be some, in order to explain this, we have to propose that there may be some factors that, uh, that support site at these, support ZEB2 expression at these exact same sites. So um, uh, to test that, Tian Tian made a reporter out of these enhancers uh, here's the wild type enhancer and express this. This is in monocytes where NFIL3 is not expressed. And you can see the enhancer has lots of activity and you can manipulate this activity by making single and double and triple mutations. But it's not until you get rid of all three of these NFIL3 binding sites that you lose all activity. So we had to figure out what was going on and what these other factors might be. And it didn't take us too long uh, but we realized that um, the, the, Zeb, the uh, CEBP family of transcription factors is actually a very good candidate for factors that would support ZEB2 expression at these sites. Because if you compare the NFIL3 binding motif to the motif that's known for CEBP family factors, you can see they're highly similar. TT, NNNN, AA. So 
Uh, Tan Tan asked whether members of the CEBP family might be activating uh, at, at these sites in the absence of when the NFL3 is not expressed. So first of all, if you express CEBP beta or CEBP alpha, uh, and then this probe is binding uh, a complex, it's either CEBP alpha shown here or CEBP beta. So it can bind to this probe and the, the probes, the sites in the middle of that enhancer, sites one, two, and three, uh, are very good at competing at these sites. So they could bind, that's one possibility. Furthermore, this is single cell RNA-seq data of the whole uh, uh, CDP. CEBP alpha and CEBP beta are both expressed well at single cell level in the CDP. So they have the chance of binding. And for, finally, uh, we did direct uh, chip seek and cut and run analysis. And here I'm showing the cut and run analysis for CEBP alpha and CEBP beta. And again, these factors directly bind to the minus 165 KB enhancer uh, at essentially, if you look very closely at the peaks, essentially at the same places where NFL3 combined. So, and, and finally, if you look for CEBP alpha and beta binding uh, to the wild type, you can see there's that peak, but they don't bind at all in when you use uh, uh, progenitors made from the Delta-123 mouse. So all of the binding of CEBP alpha, beta, as well as NFL3 uh, are dependent upon those three sites in the ZEB2 enhancer. Um, so I, I showed you before that NFL3 drives DC1 development. Uh, in contrast, overexpression of CEBP alpha and beta uh, here in a wild type uh, mouse, uh, you can see they, they allow DCs to continue to develop, but they drive all of the DCs away from the DC1, which would be in this gate, and towards the DC2 fate. So CEBPs drive DC2 development, specifically alpha and beta, um, but they only do that if those sites are present. If you use progenitors from the Delta-123 mouse where those sites are mutated, the expression then of CEBP alpha and beta uh, has no effect on the development of, uh, it does not drive DC2 development. So that's where CEBPs act. And importantly, uh, it seems to be specific for alpha and beta because forced expression of other isoforms, CEBP gamma and delta, uh, don't do this. So there's some specificity even within the, uh, the CEBP family. And finally then, uh, in collaboration here with Peter Johnson, we were able to get some CEBP beta floxed animals and we induced uh, uh, the expression of Cree in an early progenitor and put them back in vivo. And uh, if you don't delete CEBP beta, you get about this ratio of DC1 to DC2 development, but deleting beta alone uh, drives the cells more towards the DC1 phenotype. And you can see the numbers over here. So that means probably some of this residual DC2 development is being supported by CEBP alpha expression uh, uh, in addition to yeah, on top of beta. So here's our current model. Um, I have uh, a question still to answer. Uh, we need to know what is driving uh, NFL3 induction. Uh, at least this enhancer seems to be required for CDP induction of DC1 development. Uh, it's also uh, required for the uh, ILC uh, NK uh, specification, but we haven't looked into that as well. But this is an unanswered question. And then another uh, series of questions that we are actively looking for is shutting off ZEB2 seems to be critical to get a DC1. Um, we think, but we don't know, uh, that this is probably by ZEB2 acting to repress the expression of uh, either BHF3 or ID2 or both, and that it's only when you lose ZEB2 expression that you're able to pop up the expression of ID2 and BATF3, which we know are required for DC1 development. Probably at least the role of BATF3 is to sustain um, uh, uh, IRF8 autoactivation. Now, I, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna run out of time, but I wanna mention that uh, the uh, CDP also can give rise to plasma cytoid DCs, but um, people have gone back and forth about how relevant this is in vivo. We know that uh, if you culture CDPs in flip three ligand culture, you get a few PDCs. Now I mentioned that uh, the, the mouse that we made, the Delta-123 mouse, 
uh, had about 50% reduction uh, in uh, PDC numbers uh, and also as a percentage of the bone marrow. Activation of these PDCs from that persist in the Delta-123 mouse show that they make substantially less interferon than uh, wild-type PDCs. And uh, this reminded us of this paper by Sathe and Shortman uh, a few years ago, in which they intentionally looked at lymphoid versus uh, myeloid-derived PDCs, and they observed that PDCs derived from the common myeloid progenitor uh, made a lot of interferon alpha when activated compared to PDCs that they would obtain from this common lymphoid progenitor. So Tian Tian looked at that as well. Um, the uh, Delta-123 mouse, uh, when we culture common myeloid progenitors in vitro, uh, wild-type mice give some PDCs, but the Delta-123 mice uh, have uh, substantially reduced PDCs from this cell source. Whereas the common lymphoid-derived lymphoid, lymphoid, uh, lymphoid PDCs uh, were not affected between the wild type or the Delta-123 uh, mouse. And also if you culture CDPs or MDPs from wild type mice, uh, you get lots of PDCs, uh, but from the Delta-123 mouse, uh, you get very few plasma cytoid DCs. So, um, uh, so I'll just summarize that with this slide here, that we think that, um, that there's plasma cytoid DC development, both from the myeloid branch and from the lymphoid branch, but the, um, uh, the molecular basis for sustaining ZEB2 in those two pathways is different. The, uh, the myeloid branch seems to require the action of CEBPs to support ZEB2 at these uh, three sites shown in red, uh, where NFIL3 will later bind to drive uh, DC1 development but that in the lymphoid branch, uh, uh, the support of ZEB2 seems to be independent of those sites, probably instead relying on the E boxes that can bind uh, E22. Now I have just a little bit of time left. Um, so we had inadvertently made a mouse that lacks, uh, DC, uh, lacks DC2 development. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about now the consequences for the immune response in that mouse. Now, we had been here before, uh, about maybe eight years ago, we and other groups had looked at uh, various genetic models that uh, in one way or another, delete or target or functionally inactivate genes in DC2s. Um, Akiko Iwasaki had used uh, a reagent that she made uh, to delete cells expressing this uh, surface protein. And, uh, and we had done a cd 11 cre deletion of KLF4. Uh, and our results were that we saw decreased Th2 responses in a number of model systems, but it was really uh, unclear to us whether it was purely a DC2 um, uh, consequence because we had deleted KLF4 from all DCs, obviously. So, um, so we, went, we decided to go back and look at this. And so with the help of Pratesh Desai in Mike Diamond's lab and Do Hong Kim in Steve Van Dyken's lab, uh, of course, Mike and Steve are faculty here at WashU, um, we went back and used this model system, H. polygyrus, uh, which is a, a nice parasitic infection, uh, which induces a type two immune response that is also required to, uh, expel the worm and protect against uh, uh, the, the pathogen. So uh, Tan Tan initially compared uh, wild type and Delta-123 mice. Um, uh, and, and we were surprised to find that we agreed with ourselves from, from you know, long ago that here now when we're getting DC2 deficiency in the Delta-123 mice, we have a substantially increased egg burden in the feces. Uh, almost zero formation of granulomas uh, in the small intestine, and also a reduction in Th2 development uh, shown here with GATA3 uh, in, in T cells in the spleen and, and mesenteric lymph nodes, and a reduction in uh, Th2 cytokines like IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. Uh, one could ask, but these Delta-123 one, one, mice also lack monocytes. How do you know it's not that the monocytes are required for Th2 responses? So um, we were able to test that 
and I'll show you how. So in the Delta 123 mouse, all specification of the CDP is driven to DC1 development, no pre-DC2s uh, developed. But we also had recently made this Delta 32 mouse where IRF8 expression uh, in the DC1 progenitor is maintained but in the Delta 32 mouse, it's not maintained and those cells were driven back to a DC2. So Tan Tan crossed the Delta 1 to 3 mouse with the Delta 32 mouse. And uh, we were hoping that maybe the pre-DC1s caused by the 1 to 3 mutation would be diverted back to DC2s and monocytes should still be deficient. So we would then have a control. So this is the experiment she did. Wild types on the left show a pre-DC1, the pre-DC2 and the bone marrow and a distribution of DC1s and DC2s in the spleen. However, in the Delta-123 mice, we get the pre-DC1s caused by the Delta-123 mutation. But because of the Delta-32, those DC1s uh, turn back into DC2s in the periphery. So uh, here's the DC1 uh, abundance in the Delta-123 alone, but when crossed to the Delta-32 mutation, they turn into DC2s. So we have possibility uh, as a control. And importantly, the monocytes are still missing in this double cross. So now we're able to go back and repeat all of the uh, H. polygyrus experiments again. And the answer is the same, that uh, DC2s, uh, if DC2s are present, you get, uh, that's shown here. Now monocytes are missing from this mouse shown in blue, but DC2s are now restored. So you get a restoration of granulomas, uh, a complete elimination of the eggs. You get a restoration of Th2 development and of uh, restoration of IL-4, 5, and 13 production. Um, uh, so, uh, so that I'm gonna have to end here because of time. Uh, I have to apologize then to Sunny Kim who has done some work uh, to follow this up. Uh, basically to ask the question, uh, uh, that I can summarize here, uh, that uh, if the CDP is normally relying on uh, NFIL3 to drive DC1 development, what happens when, um, when uh, conditions arise that might elevate, uh, elevate uh, CEBP beta or alpha expression? So I really am gonna have to apologize, Sonny, um, I know you're out there listening to me, uh, but I'm, I'm not supposed to talk for too long. So um, uh, I could just give the answer maybe. The answer is that it's true. Inophile 6, which um, uh, is another name for CEBP beta, this factor is induced by IL-6. And other people, the, the papers I just skipped over um, actually have suggested that IL-6 might be able to uh, abate DC1 development. So this is what Sonny has shown, that um, IL-6 induces higher levels of CEPP beta in the MDP and CDP, and that this indeed leads to a loss of um, DC1 development shown here. So, um, uh, so she's gone on to show that this actually functions in vivo by making um, an IL-6 expressing tumor uh, and showing that this leads to a loss of DC1's development in the periphery and uh, a loss of DC1's uh, uh, um, in, in the uh, lymph nodes draining these tumors. Um, uh, and then, uh, and, and finally, she, uh, along with another student in the lab, Faya, uh, 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 have shown that um, Faya, uh, have shown that this happens in the human bone marrow uh, progenitors as well. So, um, so all I would say to summarize is that it's possible that elevated CEBP expression induced by cytokines or uh, such as IL-6 might in certain settings actually impair DC1 development. Um, now I mentioned just now that Faya O and Sunny together show that that works in the human. Um, uh, and the people I talked about the work uh, today's are shown in blue here. Steve Ferris showed the earliest work uh, on the DC vaccines. Tian Tian Liu carried out most of the work then on uh, the triple mutant and the 
the NFL three mechanism of debt specification. And then Sonny Kim, uh, with some help from Faya uh, O, uh, uh, did that last work that I had to skip over. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, this is the lab at present. Um, we had a lot of uh, collaborators. Bob Schreiber helps with all the tumor models in the lab. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, Pratesh, Mike Diamond, Steve, uh, and Doan Kim. Uh, and we had uh, great help from Ansu Satpathy at, and Howard Chang at Stanford. And um, uh, we also had some help uh, in work I didn't talk about specifically today from Barbara Key and Mandran Busslinger. Uh, and Mike White uh, made every mouse, Mike White and his team made every mouse. Here's a more complete list of our collaborators. Uh, <clears throat> again, I've mentioned, uh, I, I need to mention Takeshi Igawa for great help on the engineering of the, uh, of the reporter uh, that I talked about. And um, uh, uh, Julie and Ansu uh, at Stanford and Masato Kubo. Uh, and a last shout out to Peter Johnson, who helped us tremendously with the analysis of the CEDP beta uh, requirement. Okay, so. Thank you so much, Ken. That was, that was wonderful. It was an absolutely wonderful presentation. Very, very interesting. Glad you shared unpublished data. Uh, I'm sure we'll see um, uh, some more on this. Well, screen. I would have liked to have shared, if you'll let me talk for another 20 minutes, I'll be happy to share more on published data, but uh, I, I, I realized that these, they had sort of a time limit here. So I wanted to cut it off. Apologize again to Sonny and to Faya. I'm sure that we'll, we'll have, I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll see more about this shortly. I mean, in the meantime, I have a ton of questions already, but I'm sure everybody who has been listening to you, and there were a lot of people listening to you today, there will be many, many more questions. So um, for those of you who want to engage with Ken, um, please go on to, um, on to Twitter and uh, the, find the tweet that asks, ask questions for Dr. Ken Murphy here. And then uh, go ahead and we'll make sure that, uh, or Ken will make sure that you will get an answer shortly. Um, all I can, I'm left to say is this was an amazing seminar. It was wonderful. Thank you very much for joining Global Immunotalks uh, to you, Ken, and to everyone out there. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Now what do I do? Do I stay on? Wait.